Hey guys, welcome back to Cacoptics TV. Hopefully you've been enjoying these videos. Today we're speaking to Tammy Riker, who filmed One Night in Miami. Ah! You brothers, you could move mountains without ah. lifting a finger. Uh, Minister Malcolm X. Good news, the chariot is coming. Uh, who's the yeah. That's right. Jim Brown takes uh, the ball. Your record is going to stand ah. the test of time. All together, yeah. I just wanted to ask you firstly about working with Regina King, you know, her feature directing debut, although she's directed before, but I was just interested to see how that synergy was for both of you. Regina has directed television before, but this is her first feature debut, and she's a force in nature. She is just so smart and, and knew exactly the film that she wanted to make. And even if there were moments like technically she couldn't describe what she wanted, she knew the feeling and the richness and she, you know, she wanted the camera to be alive and moving, but not take away, you know, not call attention to itself, especially in the room. We didn't know each other before. My agent sent me the script from the producers and Regina, and I just absolutely loved it. Created a lookbook, you know, went in to meet her and we hit it off from the beginning. We both had the same ideas about the rich saturation and the vibrant blues in Miami. And then we were just, you know, connected at the hip for four months. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because I guess, you know, some of the conversations that take place in the film, especially around black liberation, you know, are still relevant today. And, you know, I guess Regina King herself, you know, she's chosen specific acting roles in like If Beale Street Could Talk and in Watchmen and, you know, which and I guess both of them tackle similar themes. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on bringing this important moment to life. Something that was really important to her and also to me was to to really have an immersive experience for the audience. So they felt like they were in this room you know, not so much fly on the wall because the camera does shift perspectives and, you know, make you feel where to look and what's happening, but, but so that you felt like you were in the room with the men, you know, and that it didn't get too static or, or turn into a play, which it is, you know, a stage play. So that was the biggest challenge there, how to keep this alive while two thirds of the film is in one room. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess it must have been a big pressure on the actors to depict these historical characters as well. I mean, you know, it's no uh, small feat there. And, you know, was there a big rehearsal process? And what was it like working with that cast? That was very interesting. There was not. We did not. They were all so busy and coming from, you know, all, you know, different parts of the world that we did not see the actors in that space or see that space completely finished till the night before. And then the rehearsal was the, we started with the hotel room. You couldn't really storyboard it or, you know, it, it just had to come alive on its feet. And so we decided that we would, you know, shoot it entire scenes because there were 10, 12, sometimes 15 pages of dialogue, wall to wall dialogue, amazing dialogue. You make the same mistakes with him as you did with Cooper, you won't be walking away from him. I won that Cooper fight, didn't I? You got saved by the bell. And he would have finished the job if they didn't stop the fight from all the bleeding. Oh, woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn't. A win is a win, Ferdy. I'll be back in a bit. Not even a screen direction in there. <laughs> so it was very daunting in that way. And Regina and I broke it down that we would just shoot the masters and then from there find really interesting ways to tie it together. So the cameras were both floating on jib arms. And so then we would be at the monitor together. Regina and I were all on headsets and finding a way between the operators and the camera assistant to shift the perspective and focus and keep finding the links between the characters. We would do rehearsals and put marks all over the floor and there was just so many marks that it, you know, it didn't even matter because then we'd go to shoot and rip them all up, you know, because they were in frame. So then it was really about the cameras and the operators organically reacting to what was happening in the space. Because it's so dialogue heavy, I guess something that the actors will bring to it is their movement, sitting down or standing up or walking towards a window or whatever it is. Did you build in some of this freedom for them to move about so freely. Yeah, absolutely. So Regina is very much an actor's director. So she wanted them to have that freedom and we would explore it in the rehearsal. I mean, there were a couple of scenes like, you know, she told uh, uh, Eli and Aldous, like, this is going to take place at the mirror. But then they had the freedom to move in that area. And they were, they were absolutely incredible. Their perfection and, you know, drive to get 
these men write really drove the whole crew to to raise the bar like kingsley was always had his earbuds in and was listening to um, Malcolm's speeches to get his dialect and the tone right. You know what is going on around us? It should make everyone angry. Huh? You know, you bourgeois Negroes, you're too happy uh, with your scraps to really understand what is at stake here. So even when you were lighting and you were getting the jib arm set or, you know, blocking, you would always have that in your ear. And it really created like a, Everyone just striving to make this the best that it could be. Coming to the end of the, the scenes uh, in, inside the hotel room, and all four of them then gathered around very close, almost like huddled together. You know, you had this very intense moment with everybody, and then they all gathered together, and it's almost like a rejoice. And, and, and this whole, like, closing in on it, I, you know, I'm wondering if you could explain how that came about and the process and some of, some of the conversations that might have happened, because it's such an important part before then you break up and you all go outside and it's just like it's just, it's just this sense of um, the pressures dropped and the opening. Right, right, because the tension was building and building as they came down and Sam storms off and and this was, uh, you know, we chose to bring it to a spot where we could have them all together and that, you know, there's only so many spots in that room <laughs> and it was not going to be around the table, you know, they, they all came back together and we knew, you know, cutting back and forth to Boston Ballroom that that would be a space where with all of them together, we could get behind their heads and shoot overs and get the reactions that we wanted. I mean, that was a spot where it all calmed down again. I was actually watching 12 Angry Men the other week and, you know, obviously just paying attention to that about how it was all shot in one room, um, in one location over a single span of time. And then looking at Kemp Power's original screenplay that was also set in one location uh, over a single span in time. And of course you're using these same, I'm, I'm interested in seeing the filmmaking techniques they used on that film and then the filmmaking techniques you used on this film. And I was just wondering what techniques you thought you used in order to keep the audience engaged, uh, seeing as it was just one location. The choice of shooting the Alexa 65, shooting log, large format, definitely made a huge difference. You know, the, even though you didn't see it in a the theater, like the, uh, the amount of detail that you get, you know, 6.5K is really incredible. And um, the very shallow depth of field, we used the prime DNAs wide open. So it was very, very shallow with the large format. It's just inches sometimes, you know, half an inch sometimes that you have. So I feel like that shift in focus really made you feel. And then also when we talked about wanting to keep it alive and the camera moving, I proposed to her we keep it on two jib arms, manually operated so that the camera could always keep floating. Even when it's static, there's like a very imperceptible move and it's able to float up and down. And so it was able to follow them. And then in each, wherever there was a mirror or a painting or anywhere, we could, we had a little hidey hole, like so that the mirror would pop off and there was a hole there. So B camera could also keep moving at the same time. And I feel like that you can feel the seamlessness in the cutting that it was the same take. Is, is this something when you're reading the screenplays that like, this is what I want to use? You know, we're in, we're in one room. We need to, you know, we would like to make the room look bigger or feel like it's not necessarily claustrophobic. Was, was it Lexus 65 or something that you, you first thought off the bat or were, were there other cameras that you were testing out as well? No, it was the first. I had just finished The Old Guard and that was the Alexa 65 and just loved it, loved that image and that richness. I mean, you, I remember when I went to see The Joker in the theater and I was like, I felt like I could touch it, you know, like it just felt so tactile and real and, and the fall off of the focus. So Regina had used the Alexa 65. She didn't direct it, but it, if Beale Street could talk, was the Alexa 65. And so, you know, when I presented that to her, she was like, absolutely. But we were a fairly, it's like some people don't realize because Amazon bought it after it was finished. It was not a big budget film. I mean, our shooting budget was 12 million. So it was not, um, that wasn't really in the budget. And so I presented to the producers. I said, let me talk to Ari and let's see if we can, you know, if they'll help us. And they were incredible. You know, I gave them the script gave them my whole song and dance. <laughs> they were like, we'll definitely help you. You know, we want people to know that Alexa 65 is not just for big giant action movies. It's also for small intimate movies. It's a great choice. It really does, you know, that's a, something I noticed from the very beginning. It's just like, you're, you know, like you said, you're in the room with them. You're, you're part of these really important conversations. And it's almost like, 
I can't believe I'm hearing this conversation. It really gives you that feeling, which is great. Wow, Sam, your music is deep, brother. Hey man, I love them songs. You would just get goosebumps. Like you would, it all, you know, you felt like you were really there with them. It also, the actors would stay a lot in between takes and you know, we were just tweaking and they would just hang on the bed and talk. And it, it kept it like a very small group and instead of, you know, usually they're, they're gone and then you bring them back in again. And it really felt like you were living in the moment also. Yeah. We were speaking to um, Fred and Papa Michael as well about the trial of the Chicago 7 and in particular his methodology behind crafting dialogue scenes. I guess like yourself, he had about 10, 15 page dialogue scenes from Aaron Sorkin just around a table. We were talking about how he approached those scenes, uh, yeah, I guess in the cinematography behind those scenes. And I guess he generally said that he went from the master and then he went in essentially uh, is what he did. I was wondering if that was a similar kind of process for yourself. Yeah, we did. So we would start our widest, whether we were, you know, through the window or had, you know, pulled a wall. We usually start looking front or back and then start breaking the scene down. So we would start moving in closer and closer. But Regina purposely did not. We neither wanted us wanted these big, giant close ups. You know, we wanted to always see the other characters in the background and and to feel them listening or reacting. So yeah, we would move in and then we'd flip around to the other side. And did the as aspect ratio, I mean, help for that? I was wondering the choice behind your aspect ratio and what, did it allow you? Oh, definitely, yeah. You know, we both wanted two, three, nine. You know, we wanted, uh, knowing that we'd had so many scenes where all four of them would be in the frame. I think I was reading up about it and I, was, uh, and I, and I heard you talk about the different photography and the references that you took, whether it was for the boxing matches, whether it's for things outside the hotel room, but also building the image database and, 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 and the look book or almost for the film itself. Could you tell us a little bit about that process and you know perhaps what kind of photographers that you did use and, and what, what did you draw from them? For Regina, it was really important that everything was historically accurate and there were so many, and authentic, you know, that there were so many references, obviously Ali and Malcolm, there were so many photographs that you could find. And then for the fights, the, the goat book, the Tash and Goat book, greatest of all time, that really became our Bible for the flights. Those are incredible color photos. So many of these photographs from black and white, but that, the Tashin book is in color. Mm. And we recreated the exact lighting grid from the fight. The gaffer found the, the uh, 1K Altman scoop lights that they actually used. He found them in the warehouse. And so we had the exact bulbs. We had the exact Fresnels on the end. One of my favorite shots, that big high wide looking down, yeah. is from the fashion book. And that was actually from a later flight with Liston and Ali, but Regina and I just loved that. And we were like, we have to get that when he wins and everyone comes pouring in. It's great. It's, it, it's a really, really good technique in terms of, you know, depicting the, you know, how, how those fights look like by actually getting those lights and those bulbs and fitting them in the same sequence. And, you know, and when, when you, when you, I guess when, uh, when, when everything was set up and the gaffer had set everything up and you're looking through the camera, what, what was your reaction to it? Were you like, yes, this is great. And you know, when you refer back to the picture again, you're like, brilliant. You're like, we have it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the fights were, after spending two weeks in the hotel room, the fight was so freeing because it was lit, you know, the, it was like that. And then it bounced off the white mat and faded out to the reporters and the audience. So all the focus was on capturing the fight and not, whereas in the hotel room, we had to use very low profile lights. We used the uh, Astera Titan tubes with honeycombs and magic cloth on them, but they were right above their heads. And you were always, you know, it, it was really intense, like shifting the lights and the gaffer and I at the DIT 10 and who's gone dark and who needs an eye light. We had this little baby scoop light that we had that you could sneak in and just give that little pop in their eyes. So yeah. once it hit, you know, that was just a constant, like watching, like, don't go in that corner. That's the dark corner. You know, <laughs> and then we run in and sneak in with our little eye light. And with the actors who are, and it's quite an intense scenes, various scenes inside the hotel room anyway. And I guess, that sort of lighting setup where you've got the lights right above the head, I guess it makes them feel 
in that same way probably do you think it adds a little bit more dimension for that for them as well to feel like this is this is the space this is we're, we're closed in yeah absolutely like there's no lights on stands everything's coming from the ceiling so they have that freedom to move i mean there were moments they had to duck under those jib arms sometimes to get around but it was interesting because you know you would ask them is it all right you know the you know the camera like that bob dylan scene that's one of my favorite and Malcolm just turns around and the camera's right there, you know, and he was like, I don't even feel it. You know, I'm, he was so in it. I was just wondering if you could break down your lighting setup for the hotel room. Um, I know you said, did you mention you used a stereos? Stereo Titan tubes and the Helios tubes because they were battery operated. So it's really easy to stick one in really fast, you know, without having to worry about all the cable, you know, we would always keep them backlit. So we had them in every corner, you know, coming back at us. And then once we watched the rehearsal, uh, I had the gaffer make, the gaffer for the old guard had made these incredible, we called them baby scoop and big scoop, but they were just these like clip lights almost and f put as many uh, LED bicolor cards in there and then magic cloth and a snoot and an egg crate and it became this beautiful soft eye light that it was all about keeping the light off the walls and not making the walls bright but you know getting your character and a lot of adjusting of those lamps up and down working with your production uh department the uh, production designer and and getting the right texture on the lamps and what you know the fixtures and the lamps what, how, what was that conversation what, what, what did you use in the lamps and then you know as, as you motivated light in the lamps they were just um 25 or 40 watt you know, clear bulbs, just regular Edison bulbs and dim down. And, you know, they, it's always that battle. If you use the actual lamp to light the character, then the lamp is just a burnout white, you know, glowing orb, which we did not want at all because the texture of the lamp shades and the glow. So then we would get the lamps right and then bring in, you know, the baby scoop to look like it was lighting them. And in comparison, in the boxing ring, you know, I was looking at uh, that, it was beautifully photographed. I was just wondering, uh, you know, again, you mentioned that you use, I guess, period lighting and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, you've got some really great, rich, dark shadows, I guess, in the crowd, but still have highlights of people's heads and, you know, of, of the clothing and that kind of thing. I was just wondering if you could explain how you managed that. The boxing, it really was all just bouncing off the mat and those lights coming down. Regina and I watched a lot of boxing movies together, obviously. And, you know, as much as we love Raging Bull, there were some, in other fights, we were like, we don't want ours to fall off to black. That was really important for us. So we had little pinpoints of light going back, back, back. And then in visual effects, they just kept enhancing it. So we put something there for them to keep going because most of the time we only had uh, 200, 250 crowd. So we would have to keep rotating them around as we went. Yeah, exactly. So the choreography must be pretty tricky, uh, I guess, <laughs> with a boxing match. It was to, you know, we, that was the, the boxing we did storyboard um, for what was going to happen in the ring. And then we had two cameras outside of the ring that were capturing, you know, the audience and the reporters and also always finding really interesting angles. I mean, that's what was really fun is we were doing the hits for what was happening inside the ring. You know, you'd always run back and see if that hit sold or not, uh, you know, with the boxing coordinator. And then the other two were free, just finding really interesting angles. And, you know, sometimes the hit worked and sometimes it didn't, but they used a lot of those, which I, I feel like felt again, a more, you had that audience, point of view happening. I remember uh, an interview we had with uh, Michael Chapman uh, quite a few years ago now. He was talking about how he did the opening sequence in Raging Ball. And he said, yeah, it was just him wrapped up in black material, firing off these flash guns <laughs> running around in the audience. <laughs> yeah, those are so beautiful. And they're like, they don't make them anymore. We had like, I don't know, 200 of those little cubes to poom, poom. They're so beautiful. Well, so so you, you put in uh, these flashes to represent the old uh, camera flashes, yeah. Any reporter that had a camera that we saw had a real vintage camera with the flash bulb in it. And then some of the deeper ones were just enhanced by visual effects. I was just wondering if we could just speak about your relationship with Regina on set. I know you said that she's an actor's director, and I just wondered how she differed to some of the other directors that you've worked with in the past and what made this collaboration so successful. She's very, as she should be, very protective of the actors and their experience and their rehearsal time and 
everything, you know. But as far as a cinematographer, I mean, she was incredible to work with. We, we spent so much time on the weekends watching movies, storyboarding. We literally like rode together every morning, breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. We were, <laughs> the only time I didn't sleep or was see her was like the six hours we were asleep and then we were back together again. <laughs> and that really, that bond is what, is what really helps so that we are always on the same page. You know, you could ask a question to me or Regina, you know, and you get the same answer. That really helped the experience, especially when you have to move so quickly that you're in their head and you've talked everything through. You know, we talked the day through on the hour drive in the morning and then on the way back, we'd talk about what we're doing <laughs> the next day. So that was really cool chatting to Tammy about how she shot One Night in Miami, how she shot in one room and how she created that 60s period feel with Regina King. Tell us what you guys think in the comments below. Remember to like and subscribe.